it is rather late in the morning, uh, but we've been busy working now. Keep that in mind. We're going to call the roll and uh, we will get started. Uh, we will pick up where we left off from yesterday. All right, Madam Clerk. Juror number one. Present. Juror number two. Here. Juror number three. Present. Juror number four. Present. Juror number five. Present. Juror number six. Present. Juror number seven. Present. Juror number eight. Present. Juror number nine. Present. Here. Jer Wait a minute, did two people answer? Yes, my fault. Juror number 10? Here. Juror number 11? Yes. Juror number 12? Here. Juror number 13? Here. And juror number 14? Here. All right, everybody's here. Detective Gish, bring him in. We'll uh, swear him back in and go from there. <coughs> to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. All right, please have a seat. One thing I almost forgot, I think I need to mention something to the jury. Yesterday, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard some testimony. Actually, there were some uh, statements that had been sent between Mr. Vandenberg and Mr. Quinzio and Mr. Finley uh, that were read into the record. I want you to understand that what Mr. Quinzio and Mr. Finley said at, uh, on until such time one of them testifies is not substantive evidence. So you're not to consider that as substantive evidence, what Mr. Quinzio or Mr. Finley said, unless one of them testifies or both of them testify, okay? All right, thank you. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm going to ask that you be handed a three page document. Defense counsel has reviewed that document prior to you taking the stand. Can you take a look at that and Indicate whether or not you recognize it. I do. And what is that? These are iMessages recovered from Joey Quiznos' laptop computer. Um, they were uh, on 626 of 2013. It's iMessages and um, two of the three videos that we saw yesterday that was recovered from his computer. Describe your forensic analysis of Mr. Quinzio's laptop and the video files that you found. Was there anything that was significant in your analysis? Th there was. When I saw the context of this messaging, um, I knew that there would probably be other videos, the same videos on that computer again. And 
um, during the conversation, um, it was asked that those videos be sent back to Mr. Vandenberg. Mr. Vandenberg asked that the Mr. Quizno through an eye message that he send the videos back to him. So in order for Mr. Quizno to send the videos back to him, um, it created a second video duplicate file of the two. Um, that he sent back to Vandenberg. So, a did, so in total, I found a total of five videos off of Quizneo's computer, but two of them were duplicates because he texted them through iMessage back to Vandenberg. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that the three-page document be entered as the next numbered exhibit. All right. I would also request that this witness be allowed to retain his copy. Okay, that's fine. And may I publish that to the jury? Yes. Detective Gish, I've just placed 44A on the screen. Could you please describe what is shown here? Sure. Like the messages we saw yesterday, this is a screen capture from Quizno's computer in his iMessaging conversation. Um, and we see at the very top that little red button, the tab that says Brandon in it. That was the only person in this conversation. So this was a conversation between Joey Quizno and Mr. Vandenberg. Um, on the left, we have messages from Mr. Vandenberg, and on the right, it appears that the messages have been redacted from Mr. Quisnio. Your Honor, do we, do we need to address the redactions or the previous well, instruction? Well, I, I, I think the instruction I gave a little bit a few moments ago is that the statements made by Mr. Quisnio are not substantive evidence at this point in time and should not be considered until such time he testifies, if in fact he does testify, all right? Thank you. So as we go down, we can see the date stamp there at the top. Now this date, this time on the date, the date and time, remember this would be minus seven hours Pacific daylight time. So this would be two hours behind Nashville because uh, Quisneo's laptop was set to Pacific daylight time. Um, the first message on the left there from Mr. Vandenberg, hey dude, win hey dude wins court. That was on 626.13 at 1.03 p.m. Pacific time. Good luck, my brother. Again from Vandenberg. Um, where are you at right now? 626.13 at 2.45 California time. Then from Vandenberg, send all three question mark yes. And that series of messaging started on 6:26:13 at 9:01 p.m. And the time in Nashville, Tennessee, for those messages would have been. It would have been 11:01 p.m. And I have placed 44B on the screen. Yes, that's what Vandenberg says there. And then we see on the right side under the redaction the video files that. Quizneo would sent back to Vandenberg through iMessage um, and during this copy and sending it would have made two additional files on his computer and I recovered these as well even though they're duplicates. And this third image which is 44C. Um, again at the top you see um, it, it it's kind of cut off on the video. It was all included on the first page. And the second page is the full second video that Quisneo sent back to Vandenberg. Um, and the last message from Vandenberg is more, M-O-R-E. <laughs> document to hand to Detective Gish. Detective Gish, do you recognize the document that's just been handed to you? And what, yes, ma'am. What is that? They're text messages that I recovered from uh, Joey Quizno's computer. Um, actually, they're iMessages. And um, 
when I was actually analyzing Vandenberg's, Mr. Vandenberg's cell phone through the uh, time area where we knew they were in the room from 2.38 to 3.10, of course, as I testified yesterday, there was a gap there. And when I started looking at this gap, there was a couple of things that I found that was really important in this gap while they were in the room with the victim. The first thing, of course, was the message from Vandenberg that said FaceTime. That concerned me that video may have been streamed live over of uh, this woman being sexually assaulted. The second thing that concerned me was a voice call from Vandenberg, so a phone call from Vandenberg to Joey Quizno. It was also while they were in the room. And the phone call was a minute and 11 seconds. So once I found this, and I decided when I was doing the forensic examination, I needed to look before this happened to determine if I could identify any evidence between Vandenberg and Quisnio before the time frame of the rape. And when I started looking at the uh, evidence here on Quisnio's computer, his iMessages, I found where there were plans several hours before uh, there were plans from Vandenberg telling Mr. Quisnio that he was going to have sex that night and that during the sex he was going to call Mr. Quisnio. So I thought that was really important since we had a phone call that was a minute and 11 seconds to Mr. Quisnio during the incident. And um, the last thing that I found uh, in this set of text messages was, we remember yesterday when we were talking about the image sequence gap, so the last image on Vandenberg's phone before he started deleting them um, was, I think it was 1398, I believe that's what it was. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it was 13, 1391. That was the last allocated image on his phone before the gap came. Um, and I found that picture in this text message conversation. Actually, 1391, the last available picture before the incident on his phone, um, I believe was taken at around 1020 in the evening, Nashville time, and it was sent four minutes later. Your Honor, at this time I would ask that that four-page document be entered into evidence. I would also ask that the witness be allowed to retain it just for purposes of testifying. All right, let's do 45. And may I publish that to the jury? Yes. This is 45A. Detective Gish, could you describe what's shown in this messaging conversation? This is the same message conversation between Mr. Vandenberg and Mr. Quisnio. Uh, Vandenberg messages are going to be on the left side. Uh, Mr. Quisnio's messages are going to be on the right side. And we see up here the first message from Vandenberg to Quisnio is, Miss you, what you doing? And then we see on the right side, it's 6.22.13. Um, now that would be 8.06 p.m. Nashville time. Mr. Quisnio sends Mr. Vandenberg a picture of a car. Then Vandenberg replies, OMG. And this is 45B. Again, the, it's the same conversation. Uh, I'm only going to be reading Vandenberg's side of the conversation. Um, and all of these messages are to Mr. Quisnio. Love you, 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 you. When you working till, question mark, so much. Go like my Instagram, fool. When are you scheduled till? True. I smashed last night but didn't. Ever since that goddamn pro-hormone dude, exclamation point, limp. This is 45C. I know, period, but like I was first. IDK WTF it is. Ha 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 ha. Couple of motion cons listed there, pictures. Well, we're gonna try again tonight because I'm a fuck a different girl. It's a joke out here. I'm so mad. And 45D. 
hashtag penis probs. Then we see at um, 6.22.13, and this would be 9.29 p.m. Nashville time. I'm going to make sure okay deal. And then the last picture that we see there on the left side sent from Vandenberg to Quisnio is that last picture. It's the first picture um, in that image sequence gap. That was the last allocated picture on Mr. Vandenberg's phone before the pictures started being deleted. The document can be passed for the clerk so that she can make entry of it. And Detective Gish, you're being handed a document which is five pages. I do. And what is the document? This document is a list of call logs from starting around that time frame of 2.38 in the morning um, going through four thirteen the next that, that morning. So and it's a call log from uh, Brandon Vandenberg's phone. This included all the calls that were made during the time frame. And that is on June 23rd, 2013, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And Your Honor, at this time I would ask that this report be entered as the next numbered exhibit. And I would also request permission to publish it to the jury. All right. Detective Gish, I believe that the document that you have, that there's a cover page. Could you describe that cover page? Yeah, the cover page um, on the very front is a data report that Oxygen created um, that you're going to see. It, it created this report whenever I did the um, extraction of pulling this phone log. So when I created this phone log, it created this report. And it has information about Vandenberg's iPhone, such as um, cellular numbers that are important to cellular companies that's called the IMEI or the ME, the MEID may be on here. Um, what bootloader was used by uh, Oxygen, just really kind of technical stuff for us to get the data out of there. And is it the last two pages of the report that are actually the event log for his call history during the time frame you previously mentioned? Right, it says event log and it's got a number 16. That would be the start of this um, particular dump of this time frame of the calls. And could you describe what's shown on the screen here? Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, we see the, the highlighted row at the top, and it says direction, type, party, or the contact name, the time, the duration, and whether or not the um, phone call was deleted and recovered. Um, I want to go ahead and address that for a second is because I don't want to confuse the court by saying yesterday that whenever you delete a picture or a video or a file from an iPhone that it's deleted and can't be recovered. That's true. It can't. We can't recover it. Um, remember that each file on an iPhone has an encryption key. So once you delete that file, such as a picture or an image or a, a video, that encryption key is blown out and it's, it's gone forever. You can't recover that. Now, what this is, is a database. This is a database. It's a SQLite database that's stored inside of the iPhone. 
that database has an encryption key to it. So if a person or a user was able to delete their call history, we would not be able to recover it because that key would be blown out. However, Apple, there are certain things that they do not let the user delete. Whenever you hold, the, the way you delete a file on, on an iPhone or an app is you hold the home button down until the apps kind of start shaking and then an X pulls up on top of them. If you hit that X, it deletes the app. Well, there's certain apps that don't show up in X because, of course, Apple doesn't want you deleting your database that holds all your calls and all your messages. That would be bad. They would have a line out the door for people with messed up phones. So, being it's a database, when a when an entry is deleted, it's deleted within that database and is recovered within that database. So that's the exception to the rule when we're dealing with iPhones, is when we're dealing with a database, a entry can be deleted by the user, but our software tools can go in there, scan that database, and recover that entry if it hasn't been overwritten by a new file. So that's why we have the deleted there on the right. Um, and I do believe all of these, let me go through here for a second. Yeah, all of these calls were deleted and, and recovered. So um, I'll leave that last one out there when I start talking about them. Um, the direction is the first little column there. It's either an outgoing, a missed call, uh, outgoing, incoming, or a missed call uh, to Vandenberg's phone. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. The type, also self-explanatory. It's a voice call. Um, and then we have the remote party or the contact name. That's who the call was placed to or who it was from. If the call had a contact, uh, if the number, rather, that was called had a contact associated with it, so if Mr. Vandenberg had put Sam Smith in his phone and put Sam Smith's phone number there, when Sam Smith called him, it would show up Sam Smith. So those are identified in red. If it pulls it from the contact list, it, it identifies it in red. Um, the next box is the time, and uh, we see that it's already been converted to Central Daylight Time. So the calls, the first call there starts at 219, and then the next... Uh, 219, what, in the morning? Yeah, 2.19 a.m. in the morning. I'm sorry, Judge. And then the duration, that tab uh, is just how long the call was. Um, and then, of course, I've already explained the deleted aspect. And could you go through the entries just if it was outgoing, incoming, missed, the time, and who the call was with? Okay. Um, I'll do the time first on each of these. At 2.19.07 a.m., and these are all going to be on 6.23 of 2013, so I'm not going to say the date because they're all on 6.23 of 2013. Um, there was an outgoing call made by Vandenberg to Mac Prelo. We see that number right above his name, uh, and that was for three seconds. Number two was an outgoing call at 2.22.37 a.m. to a number 510-410-4068, and that number would not be in his contact list. The third entry is a missed call. This is a missed call from Joey Quisnio at 2.48.40 a.m. Number four is an outgoing call from Vandenberg to Quinzio at 2.49.49 a.m. And this is that one minute and 11 second phone call that I mentioned just a few moments ago that I noticed whenever I first started doing the analysis. Number five is an outgoing call to Miles Finley from Vandenberg. And it was made at 2.52.56 a.m. for 10 seconds. Number six was an outgoing call to Miles Finley from Vandenberg. And it was made at 2.53.55 a.m. for five seconds. Number seven is an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Finley at 3.08.01 a.m. for two seconds. Number eight was an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd 
at 3.14.04 a.m. and that was two minutes and 31 seconds. Number nine was an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to uh, a person named Austin Carter Samuels. It was completed at 3.17.46 a.m. and was for three seconds. Number 10 is an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Finley. It was completed at 3.18.53 a.m. It was a three second call. An outgoing call to Mr. Samuels from Mr. Vandenberg. It was at 3.19.02 a.m. with no duration listed. An outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Vander Wall at 3.19.05 a.m. with no duration listed. Number 13 is an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Vander Wall at 3.19.44 a.m. for one second. Number 14 is an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Quisneo at 3.36.27 a.m. for 33 seconds. And I have recovered additional information about this phone call. And then number 16 is an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Corey Beatty at 4.13.01 a.m. for one second. Thank you, Detective Gish. And that item can be presented to the clerk for entry. Detective Gish, I'm asking that you be handed an item. And while I know we've, we've talked about a couple of different devices, kind of leaving off with your testimony, you have been describing Mr. Quinzio's laptop computer, your forensic analysis of it, and that you were in California and that search warrants were executed on multiple devices. During that time, did you ever locate, or did you determine what type of device Mr. Quinzio had when the videos were sent to him? Yeah, I do. I think it was an iPhone 4S is what was. I believe it was an iPhone 4S that Quizneo had. I believe that's what he had told me. And did you ever locate that device? No, I did locate an iPhone 4 from Mr. Quizneo from his vehicle. Um, it was analyzed and was just set up, as he told me during an interview, just as an iPod. It didn't have any service on it. So um, you actually located an iPhone 4. Where was that located? I believe it was in his car that was parked outside in the common area of his apartment complex whenever we conducted the search warrant. And did you perform a forensic analysis on that item? Yeah, I did. And did you locate any videos? No, no, there were no videos, there were no images relating to this incident. There was no evidence to assume that that was the phone that Quisneo was using at the time of the incident as well. Um, the only thing that I recovered on it, and uh, as I stated, it was, he told me it would be used as an iPod, and that's what I would find on it whenever I went back to Nashville. And I found that it didn't have any service installed on it, and that it was just full of music. So it was like an old phone that was converted just to use, I guess, for music and Wi-Fi, maybe. And for Android users' benefit, could you describe the difference? Is there a difference in the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4S? Yeah, the aesthetics, I mean, it would be in the inside of the phone just with the, the operating system, um, some tweaks maybe, something to the um, 
uh, to the screen, maybe better resolution. The aesthetics of the phone, exactly the same from what I remember. But it's uh, actually a different model. But it's a different model. It was a di completely different model phone by Apple, even though they looked exactly the same. There was a lot under the hood of that phone that um, got changed for it to have a new uh, model number. And did Mr. Quindio have a phone on his person at the time that you were in California? It was either on his person or in his room. It was either of the two. It was Mr. Quisnio's phone. But when Detective Mayo and I conducted the search warrant, we recovered a uh, iPhone 5 uh, from Mr. Quisnio. And during an interview, he stated that was his new phone. Quisnio stated, okay, sustained, moved to strike, all right, shall be stricken. The statement made by Mr. Quisnio shall be stricken. But did you analyze that iPhone 5? I did. What, if anything, did you find on that device? Um, one thing that I recovered was a voicemail, and this was a voicemail that was left to Mr. Quisnio from Mr. Vandenberg um, shortly after this incident had happened um, in Nashville. And was that what you were referring to about the 33-second call? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that 33-second call when I f said I found additional information related to that call from Quisnio, uh, to, from Vandenberg to Quisnio, it was a voice message that Vandenberg had left on Quisnio's phone. And it was recovered from Quisnio's iPhone 5. And the item that you were handed, could you describe what that is? Yes, ma'am. Let me know if you recognize Sure. Yes, ma'am. This is a receipt for an iPhone 5 um, that I recovered from Mr. Quisnio's bedroom. I do, do believe it was. It's dated 7 8 of 2013. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that that receipt be entered into evidence. Yes. All right, number 47. Check this at your state foundation. What? I'm just checking that. Okay, well. Um, I guess the better course is, uh, General, if you would lay some foundation on this. Detective Gish, you previously testified that you went to California and executed a search warrant for electronic devices and items relating to that at Mr. Quinzio's home, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And you were actually present at the home during the execution of that search warrant? I was. And You've already testified that you actually located that receipt. Where did you locate it? In his bedroom. And that receipt was in Mr. Quinzio's bedroom. Correct? It was. You also said that you located his iPhone 5. Mm -hmm. Were you able to match up the iPhone 5 with the information in the receipt? I was. All right. <clears throat> 47. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Gish, at any point did you, I mean, again, you've talked about Mr. Quinzio, but you had also referenced yesterday Mr. Finley. At any point did you analyze any devices of Mr. Finley's? I did. And could you describe that analysis? Right. Um, when we conducted the search warrant at Mr. Finley's residence, he wasn't there. Uh, family members were there. Um, I instructed the family members why we were there and that we needed to talk to Mr. Finley about an incident that happened in Nashville. Um, Mr. Finley was hesitant to come to meet us at first, but then decided to come and meet us uh, outside of his residence. So he drove up, and when he stepped out, uh, we, Detective Mayo and I, uh, took his phone off of his person um, because we had a search warrant. For, for his person as well. Um, and when I recovered this iPhone from him, from his person, it was in post-white mode, which means the phone had just been wiped and it was ready to plug into iTunes to be reset. Now, when a phone is plugged into post-white mode, and it's, or I'm sorry, strike that. When a phone is white and it shows the post-white mode, you can't recover any data from that iPhone, again, because of the encryption that we're dealing with. Um, I brought the phone back and did plug it in to, to Oxygen or Celebrite One to take a look at it, and there was no data recovered off of that telephone. And did you locate any laptops or computers at Mr. Finley's residence? Yeah, quite a few. And did you perform a computer forensic analysis on those items? I did. And what, if anything, did you locate related to this incident and videos being sent? 
Nothing. Detective Gish, at any point, I know you've testified about multiple phones, and you've testified about videos being sent to Mr. Quincy and Mr. Fenley. You also testified yesterday that one of the videos was sent to Mr. Austin Carter Samuels and Mr. Chris Boyd. Did you ever receive a phone belonging to Mr. Austin Carter Samuels? I did. And did you perform, what if anything did you do with that device? Um, without going into specifics like yesterday, the same process I did with Vandenberg's phone, Beatty's phone, Banks's phone, McKenzie's phone. It was fully processed with oxygen. Um, there was data on the phone, it, normal use, um, calls, pictures, uh, uh, text messages, but there wasn't anything related to the incident on Mr. Samuel's phone. And if the witness could be handed previously entered exhibit number 19. I do. Yes, ma'am. What is that? This is the iPhone that belonged to and was seized from um, the person I mentioned yesterday named Christopher Boyd. And what, if anything, did you do to that item? Um, same, same process. It was processed with oxygen the same way as the other phones, uh, forensically. And then all of the data was analyzed to determine if any information uh, about the incident was uh, stored on this phone. And did you locate any videos or pictures on that device? I did not. And I would ask that the witness be handed a five-page document, which defense counsel previously reviewed. Could you take a look at the document and let me know if you recognize it? I do. This and is a. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. If you can do exactly what you're doing and explain what it is. This is a text. Uh, these are the iMessage conversation that was pulled from Mr. Boyd's phone, and it was uh, iMessage conversations with Mr. Vandenberg. And your honor, at this time, I would ask that that five-page document be entered as the next numbered exhibit. Number 48. And may I have permission to publish it to the jury? All right. Detective Gish, which should be popping up on the screen, is 48A. Right. This is um, a text message, iMessage conversation between uh, Christopher Boyd and Vandenberg, Mr. Vandenberg. And keep in mind, this is from Mr. Boyd's phone. Uh, so the sort of the same thing, a different format. We see who it's from. Uh, the first call right there on the on the top is from Vandenberg. Uh, that's because Vandenberg is in his contact list because it shows up the name. We see the phone number. And then to the right, we see the two different timestamps again. As explained yesterday, we know both of those timestamps mean the same exact thing, but we look at the central daylight time because that's what time it was in Nashville. Um, then we see uh, the direction, whether it was incoming, outgoing, uh, in about the middle of the page, if you look to the right under the blue box, we see if it was deleted and if it was recovered. Um, also the caveat on this, this, this is a database just like the cell phone database. So since it's an iPhone, if you delete a text message, it doesn't get overwritten and it's not encrypted inside that database. So they can still be recovered if they're deleted. If we see deleted, it was deleted and recovered by the software. Um, and then we can see the content of the message right in the middle that says FaceTime. So this message was from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd. And again, I think all of these are on 623. If they're not, I'll change, I'll, I'll note. It was at 2.49.20 in the morning, and it says FaceTime. It was deleted and recovered. Maybe the, you can 
have the direction, the content, and the time for the remaining messages? Sure. It was from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd. I'm coming at 3.19 a.m. And this is 48B? Um, from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd, my phone's at 1% at 319 12 a.m. From Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd, meet me outside the emergency door at East. And that was at 319 12 a.m. And this is 48C? That was to Mr. Vandenberg from Mr. Boyd, come get us, 319.22 a.m. And this is from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd, okay, I'm leaving now, my phone's gonna charge in my room. And that was at 320.27 a.m. This is 48D. From Mr. Boyd to Mr. Vandenberg, I'm at Gillette, six, uh, I'm sorry, 3.20.30 a.m. Then from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Boyd, I'll come out from Gillette at 3.20.45 a.m. And is that all of the documents that you have? Did that cover all of the text messages that you have? From Mr. From Beatty and yes. Vandenberg? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. That's Mr. Boyd. I mean, Mr. Boyd, I'm sorry. Thank you, Judge. The text issue, and I'm sorry, this absolutely had to be in there. Detective Yeshkin, you previously testified about your analysis of Mr. Vandenberg's phone. Did you locate the same messages? between Mr. Boyd and Mr. Vandenberg on Mr. Vandenberg's phone? Yes. And were they in a format where you could tell specifically that they were, which actually it might help if I can pass you a document so that you can look at it. Without telling me any of the actual content, can you generally tell me what that document is? These are additional text messages between Mr. Vandenberg and Mr. Boyd that I recovered off of Mr. Vandenberg's phone. And again, you, in the beginning of your testimony, which I know this was yesterday, but you were referencing that there was a content of messages that there were, you couldn't determine who the sender was. Right. And you had testified that when you located Mr. Quincy's computer and the messages in their iMessage conversation, that that content matched up with some of the information from Mr. Vandenberg's phone. It did. And again, the content during the time frame of the incident on Mr. Vandenberg's phone, did it match up with what you located on Mr. Boyd's phone? Yes. Okay. And uh, Your Honor, I don't think that there's any reason to enter that document into evidence, but if we can just mark it for identification. Sure, that would be fine. Your Honor, I would just ask that it be available for the defense to use the book we entered. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. 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 Yes, ma'am. These are text messages that I recovered from Beatty's phone that on a conversation, I messages that he, a conversation that he had with Mr. Vandenberg. And is that the sum total of messages between Mr. Beatty and Mr. Vandenberg? This is it. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that that document be entered into evidence as an exhibit. All right. Let me let me see that for just a second. Yes, sir. All right. <coughs> 
That would be number 49. And may I publish that to the jury, Your Honor? All right. Gentlemen, we're going to make that number 50 because uh, 49 would be the ID on the exhibit. Yes, Your Honor. Detective Gish, I've just placed exhibit number 50 on the screen. Can you describe what is shown? Um, yes, ma'am. Again, this is from Mr. Beatty's phone, and this is a conversation, uh, iMessage conversation that he and Mr. Vandenberg was having. Um, the first message is from Mr. Vandenberg to Mr. Beatty. It says, what room number? And it was sent on 626 of 2013 at 4.54.08 p.m. The second message is from Mr. Beatty to Mr. Vandenberg, and it says 6.14. And that time and date stamp is 6-26-2013 at 4-55-26 p.m. Thank you, Detective Gish. And that item can be entered, and then I have a, another document to be handed to the witness. <laughs> I believe that's a five-page document. Yes, ma'am. And could you, do you recognize it? I do. And could you describe what it is? These are all of the calls that were recovered from Mr. Vandenberg's phone from the call log that he had with Mr. Bay. And Your Honor, I would ask that that be entered as the next numbered exhibit. All right, that'll be number 51. And may I publish it to the jury? You may. And Detective Gish, is this the report that I believe you described previously a few exhibits ago of the cover pages to the report? Yes, ma'am. And I have just scrolled to the fourth page. Could you describe what is shown here? Yes, this is the call log. It's in the same format that we had seen earlier. Um, at the top, we see direction, type, what the contact name was, the time it was made, the duration, and whether it was deleted or not. Um, the first call was outgoing. Um, again, these are all from Mr. Vandenberg's phone, um, and they're all to Mr. Beatty. So it was an outgoing call from Mr. Vandenberg on 6-23-2013 at 4-13-01 a.m. for one second. It was deleted and recovered. Uh, number two was a missed call from Mr. Beatty to Vandenberg on 6-23-2013 at 1-54-16 p.m. It was deleted and recovered. Number three is a missed call from Vandenberg to Mr. Beatty on 6-25-2013 at 11-44-09 p.m. It wasn't deleted. Number four, outgoing call to Mr. Beatty from Vandenberg, 625 2013, 11 27 p.m. Uh, it lasted for a minute and 21 seconds. Number five is a missed call uh, from Beatty to Vandenberg, 625 of 2013 at 11 p.m. Number six is an outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty at 6.25.13 at 11.51.12 p.m. No duration listed. Number seven, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty. 6.26 of 2013 at 4.42.49 p.m. Two seconds. Number eight, an incoming call from Beatty to Vandenberg. 
6-26-2013, 4-47-22pm, 39 seconds in length. Number nine, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty, 4-54-25pm, 8 seconds in length. Number 10, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty, 9-51-34pm on 6-26 of 2013, 6 seconds in duration. Number 11 was an incoming call from Beatty to Vandenberg, 626 of 2013, 9.52.49 p.m. That call lasted for a minute and 40 seconds. Number 12, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty, 626 of 2013 at 9.57.21 p.m., two seconds in length. Number 13, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty, 626 of 2013, 9.57.32 p.m., two seconds. Number 14, outgoing call from Vandenberg to Beatty, 626, 2013, 11, 13, 18 p.m., three seconds. Number 15, missed call from Beatty to Vandenberg, 626, 2013, 11, 35, 26 p.m. Number 16, a missed call from Beatty to Vandenberg, 626, 2013, 11, 36, 26 p.m. And then the last call, outgoing from Vandenberg to Beatty, 626, 2013, 10 o'clock and 9 seconds a.m. in the morning. And that was it. The duration of that call was 2 minutes and 24 seconds. A one page document. Yes, ma'am. Do you recognize that document? I do. This is uh, when I was searching for web history on Vandenberg's computer, I didn't find any. But remember yesterday when we were speaking of, I found the web page previews, which were the screenshots of the pornography that was found during the incident time. Um, during that analysis within that folder to look for these web page previews, um, I found another preview uh, that was created, that was, uh, basically it was a web search done on the computer, Vandenberg's laptop. And it was created on 6-27 of 2013 at 3.04.26 p.m. Um, and it's a web page of Southern Illinois University. And the topic is sexual assault. And Your Honor, I would ask that that be entered as the next number to exhibit. Right. Yes, sir. It was 3, uh, it was 6-27 of 2013. And it was at 3.04.26 p.m. All right. You know, check this with relevancy of something on like 6.27. Well, I'm going to overrule it. And Your Honor, may I publish that to the jury briefly? All right. Your Honor, was that Exhibit 52? I didn't hear you. Was that Exhibit 52? 52, yes. Thank you. Detective Gish, I believe that you've described the content of this web page preview. Yes, ma'am. Is this what you were describing when you had it in your hand? Yes, ma'am. And the date and time is that the fourth line down at the top of the page? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to hand you what is 
believe a 10 page report if you can take a look at it let me know if you recognize it I do. This is um, text messages that I recovered, iMessage conversation that I recovered from Mike Prelew's cellular uh, phone, his iPhone. And this was a text conversation between Prelew and Vandenberg. You know, at this time, I'm going to ask that that exhibit be, enter, be marked just for identification purposes. Right. Fifty-three for ID only. Detective Gish, another document. If you can take a look at it and let me know if you recognize it. do. This is <clears throat> um, a document that contains a call history from the victim's phone. And it's a call history from 622 of 2013 at 525.44 p.m. to 623 of 2013 at 227.59 p.m. And you're at this time, I'm going to ask that that report be entered as the next numbered exhibit. Your Honor, can I ask uh, what report he's referring to? Uh, yes. Uh, just, just so I can mark the exhibit that he's giving. All right. Just restate it. <clears throat> it's a uh, call history report from, from uh, the victim's phone, and it contains 10 calls. And your honor, may I publish the exhibit to the jury? All right. <clears throat> Detective Gish, I just, just placed exhibit 54 on the screen. Could you describe what is shown? Yes, again, this is a call history um, that was taken from the victim's phone. Um, it starts on 622 of 2013 at 525.44 p.m. and it runs through 623, 2013 at 227.59 p.m. And could you just briefly go through the actual call history? Yeah, sure. Um, on the right side, we see all of these had been deleted and recovered. Um, the first call is outgoing to uh, Deborah at 525, I'm sorry, it's on 622, 2013 at 525.44 p.m., 40 seconds. The second one is a missed call from Jake Bernstein. 623 2013 at 25532 a.m. The third one is an outgoing call to Jake Bernstein on 623 2013 at 75435 a.m. six seconds. Number four is an outgoing call from the victim to Jake Bernstein 623 of 2013 at 80527 a.m. No time listed. Number five is an outgoing call to Jake Bernstein, 623, 2013, 8.07.58 a.m. No time listed. Number six is an incoming call from Maddie Jensen, 623 of 2013, 8.17.54 a.m. Two minutes and 16 seconds in length. Number seven was a missed call from Maddie Jensen to the victim, 623-2013 at 8.23.16 a.m. Number eight is an incoming call from Maddie Jensen 
to the victim. 623-2013 at 823-43 a.m. That call was uh, eight minutes and three seconds in length. Missed call from Maddie Jensen to the victim, 623-2013, 1148-50 a.m. Number 10, the last one here in this list is an incoming call to the victim from Jenna D. A-G-O-S-T-I-N-O -O on 6-23-2013, 2-27-59 p.m., 15 seconds in length. Thank you, Detective Gish. I'm going to hand you one last document. <coughs> Detective Gish, do you recognize the document that's just been handed to you? I do. This is um, iMessage conversation that was taken from Mr. Vandenberg's phone with the victim. And, Your Honor, I'm going to ask that that exhibit be marked for ID only at this time. All right. However, I am going to request that Detective Gish be allowed to read the outgoing messages of Mr. Vandenberg. Fine. Detective Gish, if you can go through and just read aloud the date and time and the content of only the outgoing messages from Mr. Vandenberg to the victim in this case. To the victim, 625-2013, p.m. From Vandenberg. No, I'm not. Frowny face emoticon. What did you just say? Frowny face emoticon. Oh, okay. It's the only way I know. How I, to I just that. I just couldn't make out what the <laughs> words. That's all. That that's a kind of a emoticon's a picture. It's doesn't say frowny face. No, I'm not the emoticon. This is all so messed up. Like I didn't do anything and I feel like I'm getting blamed for stuff that didn't even happen. Period. I just want to cry. To the victim. 625-2013 10.40.02pm from Vandenberg. Me and a bunch of my teammates are probably going to get kicked off the team unless something changes. To the victim, 625-2013, 10.40.56pm from Vandenberg. Not, to not tonight, tomorrow can we? Question mark. From Vandenberg to the victim, 625-2013, 11.05.33pm. Maybe I'll call you later. From Vandenberg to the victim, 625-2013, 11.21.10pm. I heard Jake spreading rumors and stuff, IDK, why? From Vandenberg to the victim, 625, 2013, 11, 50, 51 p.m. IDK, it's all rumors, but this stuff is so whack, I would never do anything like that. For, for, for the sake of clarity, I, I know what it means, but maybe some of the jurors may not. IDK? Uh, it's an acronym for I don't know. Thank you, Judge. All right. From Mr. Vandenberg to the victim, 626-2013, 12-14-26 a.m., night, and then a 
looks like a happy face emoticon. From Vandenberg to the victim. 626, 2013, 12, AM, sweet dreams. From Vandenberg to the victim. 626, 2013, 9, 18, 19 AM. Okay, great, this is such a mess. I'm never helping anyone get home ever. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013, 9, 18, 55 AM. Next time, just not gonna care, LOL, which is an acronym for laugh out loud. I feel like I'm getting punished for taking care of you that night, period, period. From Vandenberg to the victim. 626-2013, 9-21-52am. I'm just frustrated. From Vandenberg to the victim. 626, 2013, 9 32 29 a.m. When are we going to when are we going to cook? Exclamation point question mark. From Vandenberg to the victim. 626, 2013, 9 32 50 a.m. Got to show you my skills. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013, 114827 AM. Okay, cool. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013, 15422 PM. Question mark. It's just a question mark, it doesn't say question mark. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013. 7.27.50 p.m. I'm at church right now. I'll call you after. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626-2013, even on the minute, p.m. What happened today? From Vandenberg to the victim, 626-2013, 8:19:46 p.m. I thought you said you talked to everyone today and watched the video. Question mark. From Vandenberg to the victim. 6:26:2013, 8:26:58 p.m. That's weird because they said you watched it this afternoon. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013, 8:32:35 p.m. Hmm, HMM. That's weird. Well, I was told I wasn't supposed to talk to you till it's over. Till I wasn't supposed to talk to you till all this is over. Dot dot dot. Uh, frowny face emoji con. From Vandenberg to the victim, 626, 2013, 844.14 p.m. All right then, I guess we can talk right now, dot, dot, dot. I would never let what they're saying happen to you. That's messed up. Sorry, it was they were mixed in. Your Honor, may I have one moment to confer with counsel? Sure. I believe that I'm done, but might need to ask a question.
not have any other questions for Detective Gish. All right. We're, I mean, it's so close to lunch. We're going to go ahead and break and come back at 1 o'clock. So uh, I'll see you at 1 o'clock, everybody. All right.